Why Gorbachev? Here we go. All right, gentlemen, we're going to start something new tonight, something special. Kedar Kenu Bakodesh, I'd like to start with a Beracha, because we could really use the Beracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shakol Niya Bilbaro. The reason behind this class is that if you take a look at what's going on out there today, you'll understand how many people are struggling. Once upon a time, it didn't seem that people struggled as much, even to make a simple living, as what we're watching today. And it's not because it's tougher to make money. And it's not because the marketplace or the industry became a tougher place to compete in. It's because we <coughs> became smaller people. Once upon a time, their emunam bitachon was big. And the way they lived, simply, hand in hand with God. And the fringe de benefits that come from someone that lives with Hashem every step, every moment, every every waking moment on a minute-to-minute -minute relationship with God has unbelievable perks. <laughs> and one of those areas that they really thrive was when it came to their parnasah, when it came to their money. Because to them, their belief in God wasn't just someone to lean on, but literally everything they did, they did with him. So he was inside everything they did. It was like having a partner. But what type of partner? I mean, could you get a better partner than this? Could you get a partner that knows where the industry is going, knows what's going up, what knows what's dropping, know, knows what's gonna succeed this year, and knows what's going to tank? Could you get a better partner than that? At the same time, he needs no funder because he is the funding of everything. At the same time, he doesn't ask for much more than just simply to rely on him as a trusty, loyal partner slash father slash best friend. And to be loyal back in return. Now, I know on the opening words of this class, it seems, wow, Rabbi, you really simplified that. I wish it was that easy. Who wouldn't sign up? I mean, come on, really. Who, <laughs> who wouldn't run up there and say, me first? I'll take him as my partner. I hope he takes me as his partner. That, that's, that's. I will tell you, I want to tell you something. There's a pasuk I want you to learn. A pasuk that you heard from me in the past in other speeches. Hu yikraeni aviata. I'm calling out to you. You're my father. Answer me. Save me. Keli, Sur Yeshuati. You're my God. You're my strength. You're the source of my Yeshua. It's only you. That's tonight's point. I want to drive home tonight a point. The concept that Hashem wants to hear from you that it's only him in your world and nobody else. And we're going to rely on only him and no one else. Did you hear that? That means that true bitachon is not simply to trust in God, believe in God, rely on God, but you're missing the big word, only. To rely only on Hashem. Everybody else out there, oh yeah, they're part of my world and they're important 
and they play a role like anything and everyone else in life. And I'm going to roll and go through the normal steps of life like anybody else. And therefore, if somebody, God forbid, gets sick, he goes to a doctor. He doesn't sit on the couch and say, okay, I believe in Hashem, I'm boteach, he'll cure me. No, he wants you to act normal. He wants you to be normal in a way that the world was meant on a natural way to work. You get sick, you go to the doctor. You want to start a business, take a proper partner, get a good concept, use your creativity, go out there, give it all you got. God doesn't want lazy people. Make no mistake, don't get the wrong message here. But he do want, does want you to know that when you do go to the doctor, in the back of your mind, you say to yourself, I'm going through these motions because he wants me to be responsible, but I know that it's not the doctor that's curing me, it's you, Hashem. And even the pills that I pick up in the drugstore, as I'm taking the antibiotics, while reading the label, figuring out if it's one or two times a day, I'm again saying to myself, it's not these pills that are going to cure me or knock out the infection. It's you, Hashem. This is an incredible concept. The way Jews once lived, almost naturally. But because today we live in this Hollywood society and uh, the poison got in us, and we've got tempted while we tasted the prohibited of America. So that poison throws our minds off to think the way our fathers and grandfathers once upon times thought. So today we need to develop that, that secret again, that connection again. And tonight I wanna to show it to you from the literal pasuk itself. Are you ready for this? From the first sentence. I'm about tonight to attempt to do the impossible <laughs> and try to prove to you that even the very first sin of history was a product and a child from the lack of emunam bitachon. Now don't get me wrong, the first sin in history was done by a perpetrator known as the Nahash who we know as the Yetzer Hara, and his sin was speaking Lashon Hara about God, telling Chava that the reason why God doesn't want you to eat from that tree is because if you're going to eat from that tree, you're going to be as great as he. And God doesn't like competition. So he's already speaking against God. So the, the first sin ever done in history was the Nahash. He spoke Lashon Hara. That's why till today his tongue, because it's the tongue that he went wrong. But I'm talking about the first sin of man, people. Our first sin, Adam and Chava, that sin could have been avoided. If not for a certain lacking emunah and bitachon. Meaning, if there, if her, Bitachon and Emunah was 100% rock solid, that would never have happened. She would not have fell. And the world today would not be the world that we live in, the way it is. I'd like to prove that tonight. It's a big one, but nonetheless, I think that we can get to this. Let's, gentlemen, start from the beginning, from Benishit. In the beginning, God created the world. That's right. There's a balabai. There's someone who created the world. There's a boss. There's someone who's in charge. There's someone who from day one planned and ran every detail that you know today as the world. No, there is no such thing as nature. Everything that happens, happens for a reason. Everything that happens is with a plan and a purpose for something brilliant, whether it be in the world or whether it be in our lives. But that's the way God operates. <coughs> and that was the biggest message to teach me and you in the beginning of the Torah, more than and bigger than any mitzvah, 
And any other message, God could have started the Torah with the first mitzvah. He didn't. But rather, he started the Torah with the first concept. And that is, he's the Balabayit, and he created the world. He's in charge, and he's been in charge ever since. With those ideas, there the parasha runs off and tells us the great story about Adam and Chava. Adam and Chava, they were put in paradise. Could you imagine millions of the most magnificent trees that you've ever could imagine in even a fantastical way? Millions! In a place called Gan Eden, which wasn't so much an island, but it was a place that was even larger than planet Earth. So could you imagine millions of trees in a place larger than planet Earth? And God comes to Adam and Chava and tells them, listen, you could have from any of the most magnificent trees you want. Just this one tree I don't want you to go near. Don't go near its Hadad. That's it. Wow. That's an easy one. Millions versus one. I'll take the millions. Why not? And sure enough, as we all know the story, the way it went down, the way the Torah tells us is that one day Chava goes to pick from the fruits of the garden and who shows up? The Nachash. That's right. He always shows up. He never takes off. He never goes on vacation. He never gets sick. He always knows exactly when to show up day or night. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. He just hangs on you, waiting for the moment that he can strike. And at that moment, there he is. There's that newsman. He shows up. And he shows up and he comes to Chava. And he comes and he begins to tempt her to try to get her to sin and to take from the prohibited fruit from the illegal tree. Guys, I want to ask you a question. A question I don't know if you ever heard from before. Why did he go after Chava? Why did he go after Adam? Both Adam and Chava were both equally told that that's the one tree that you're not allowed to take from. Now, guys, right now in the minds that you're thinking, you're thinking the differences between men and women. But what you need to understand is that we're still holding by the point of the game here before they sinned. So that means that neither of them were cursed. And if neither of them were cursed, so at this point in time, they were both equal. So if they're equal, why would you go after one partner over the other? They're 50-50, equal, equal. And yet, he went after Chava and did not go after Adam. Why? Open your hearts. I want to tell you something tremendous. And this is going to lead us into our idea of Bitachon, rule number 11, tonight's class. Listen to this. It's amazing. The Vilna Gaon, the great Gaon, he asks, you know, it's very interesting. You take a look, you'll see that in the animal kingdom, Hashem created the male and the female. By all species, that there is a male and female to be created. In the very beginning, Hashem created the male and the female right off the bat in the beginning. So he created the lion and the lioness. And he created the cow and the bull. And he created, and so on and so forth, all the male and females of each species. All of a sudden, when it comes to man, the most important creation in the world, he creates man. The Gemara in the ninth Perek, Masech Berachot, has a big machloket. When God created man, did he create him as we know man? And then later on, he took a piece from him, a rib from him, a selah from him, 
and from that he created woman? Or maybe another idea in the Gemara is, do partsufim, says the Gemara, that they were literally back to back, the way you would picture today Siamese twins. Where, just for creativity's sake, let's just say the woman was the knapsack of the man. Okay? Pain in my back. She's the, she's the knapsack of the man. They are attached back to back, two heads looking in opposite directions. Okay? And wherever one went, the other one went. Obviously, attached by the hip. Says the Gemara, Hashem brought a tardema, a sleepy style wind, and put man, woman, attached as one to sleep. And then the Gemara says, he split them. And at that point, the woman went off to do what she does, and the man went off to do what he needs to do. Asks the Vilna on two great questions. Number one, how come every other animal you simply created a male and a female? All of a sudden, when it comes to the most important creation, man, you create them as one being attached. Question number two asks the Vilna on God, if you originally created them attached back to back, if your plan was to later on kind of split them, then why'd you just do that in the first place? Why did you have to create them originally as one entity and only later on surgically do an operation on them, so to speak, and split them, having each one go their own way to be their own beings? If your idea was that they should be independent, then just simply create them independent as you did with the animals, male and female. What were you thinking? Answers that will not go on something brilliant. And for those of you who are married, what you're about to hear now should take your marriage to a new level. And those of you who are looking to get married, I hope that what you're about to hear now is going to take the idea of marriage to a new level. Says the Vilna Gaon, Hashem originally, Bidafka on purpose, created man and woman as one entity so that they both will feel each other as one. You know why? Because by the animals, the lioness, when she goes out hunting and she brings food back to feed the cubs and the animals, she doesn't feed the lion. The lion has to go on his own and fetch his own food. You know why, says the Gaon? Because the female animal has no emotional, physical, emotional feelings or attachment to the male animal. She fends for her own and he fends for his own. She'll take care of her cubs until they grow to a certain age, but that's it. She gets her own food, she feeds her animals, her cubs, but her husband has to go out and fend for his own. There is no emotional attachment of feeling that, oh my gosh, honey, you're hungry? I can feel your hunger. I need to feed you. There's no such thing like that when it comes to animals. Says the Gaon, you know why? Because they originally were created separately. And because of that, they never were a part of each other. They never had a real bond between each other. And that's why they never will feel for each other. However, when it came to man, when it came to Adam, Hashem Bidafka created man and woman as one body, as one entity at first. So that literally my arm is your arm. My leg is your leg. Every ouch, every scratch, every pain of yours, I can feel. Now I can split you in two and continue that emotional attachment as you go on as independence. That was the brilliance, says the Gaon, behind why Hashem created man 
and woman at first together and then split them later on. So even after they're split, she could feel, feel his hunger and he can feel her ups and downs and her pain. That's called an amazing relationship. Matter of fact, gentlemen, we have a word for this. It's called marriage. That's what marriage was meant to be. And if that's not what marriage is, then we got to take marriage back to the drawing board. We're going to have to take the man and the woman and a lot of Elmer's glue and re-stick them back together again and kind of remind them, hey, hello, once upon a time, you were literally one. You literally shared the same left arm, the same right elbow. When one got a mosquito bite, the other one scratched it. You were literally one entity. Remember who you were. And now we can split you back again and have each one go their way with a new connection and a new tie between each other. That's the way it was meant to be. Says the Vilna Gaon, once Hashem split them, so they had such an attachment for each other because they started out together as one that now when they went out, they went out really to just serve each other. So Adam went to do his job of the partnership of each other and Chava went to go do her part of the partnership of each other. What was that partnership? Are you ready for this? Says the Targum Yonatan ben Uziel, the partnership was that man was placed in Gan Eden, Le'ovda Ulishomra. Gee, that's a funny thing. He was placed in Gan Eden to work the garden. You placed him in a garden that needs no work to go work it. How do you do that? <laughs> How do you place someone in a garden to go work in a garden that everything runs automatic, everything grows automatic? Everything is perfect beyond your imagination of perfection. What is there to do? What is there for them to do? Says Tarbin Yonatan ben Uzel. No. Ul ovda ul shomra. It means le fulchane di dioraita ul shomre mitzvot. God took man and put him in Gan Eden to le ovda means to work the Torah there and to be shomer the mitzvot there, meaning Adam Arishon was the first kolel guy, placed in Gan Eden to sit and learn Torah, while his wife was the one that went out to bring the food home, pick it off the trees that were permissible, bring it back, cook it up, and give him his food and feed him. It was the idea that we know today as Yisachar and Zivulun. One learns and the other one supports. But originally it started out, that partnership, as husband and wife. That the husband went to sat down to learn and the wife actually was the breadwinner. She was the one who actually brought home the food and would feed him. Aha. Uh -huh. So if that was the partnership where he's supposed to be sitting and learning Torah and she's the one that goes out and brings the food? Now I understand why the Nachash went after her. Because he tried to go after him. But as long as Adam was learning Torah, he was untouchable. He was immortal. You need to know that from the moment, from the split second that Adam was brought into this world, the Nachash, the Yetzer Hara, was already after him to try to kill him. From the first moment of his creation. Rabbi Miller is known to say, and I, I don't mean to scare anybody about what I'm about to tell you now. And the first time this happened to me, I thought like, uh-oh, I'm losing it. But Rabbi Miller, Rabbi Miller was known to say, he says, when you find yourself, let's say one time, you know, in camp, we go hiking, you go mountain climbing, and you get to the top of this mountain, and just for that one minute, you turn around and you look down and you're like, ah, and you get the butterflies. All of a sudden, Rabbi Miller says, you're going to hear a voice inside your head that says, jump. This happened to me once. <laughs> I, was, I, I was actually in camp once. 
with a whole group of guys, and we were, we were hiking up a mountain, and I looked off the side of the mountain. This happened to me again one time in Israel when I was running up Masada, and I looked off the side of the mountain, and it was a drop. And I looked down for a minute, and all of a sudden, I heard this voice that said, just jump. And I stopped and said, who said that? Are you joking with me? Are you crazy? Rabbi Miller says, you know who that voice is? That's Yitzhak Hara. Every moment, he looks for that opportunity to finish you at any which way he can. You will hear that voice. From the moment that man was created, that voice was already after him. From the minute that that Adam was created, the Nachash was already out to kill him. But he couldn't get him. You know why he couldn't get him? Because Adam was sitting in the Gan Ul Ovda Ul Shomra, says Targum Yonatan ben Uriziel. He was learning Torah. And as long as he's learning Torah, he's immortal, he's untouchable. Come on, guys, when did we have that story of someone trying to come to kill somebody, but he found them learning Torah, and therefore he was untouchable? David HaMelech! You want to hear something amazing? David HaMelech was the Gilgul of Adam HaDishon. Wow, look at that. History repeats itself again. Yeah. Just like the Nachash, the Malchamave, came after Adam HaDishon, but couldn't touch him because he was learning. He was learning Torah. So too, he tried to get him round two when he came back as Adam Adishon. And this time again, Adam pulled the same technique, but this time David. And David is sitting and learning Torah the entire Shabbat. And the Malach HaMavet shows up to try to take the life of David HaMelech, and he can't touch him. Because David, the Gilgul of Adam, learned the technique. As long as I'm learning Torah, Yetzer Hara cannot touch me. I'm untouchable. I'm immortal. Amazing. And that's why, you know what the uh, Malach HaMavet did by David HaMelech? Because he couldn't touch David because he was learning Torah, just like Adam HaRishon. How did he end up getting him? He went to the back of the house, says the Gemara, the back of the castle, and he shook the trees in the Gan. You know what that means? He brought back the trees from Adam Arishon, the Etz Adat, the original sin. And he shook that original sin from round one that brought down Adam the first time. And he got David to stop learning for a second because he went back to the tree that brought him down in round one. And now he brought him down again in round two. And the second David stopped learning because he looked up at through the window at the trees for a minute, that was the moment that he took a step up on the steps and the steps broke and the Malchamavah took his life. But what do you see from here? He could not touch him as long as he was learning. Can I share something interesting with you? The name Adam is actually short for really three people. Aleph, Dalid, Mem. Aleph is Adam. Dalid is David. And Mem is Mashiach, Adam, David, Mashiach. He had said hara. He came to Adam, couldn't get him because he was learning. Then he came to David, couldn't get him because he was learning Torah. And so too now in the times that Mashiach is going to come. He had said hara has his fingers around everybody's neck. And he's trying to get this generation and turn the world upside down. And boy, is he doing a great job. And he gave us all the bitten apple, the phone, and he put it on our hip. And he told us, indulge, enjoy in the forbidden. I'm bringing you all down. And the only people that are going to survive him are the ones that learned the lesson from the Aleph and the Dalid and then the Mem. Just like Adam Arishon was learning Torah, he couldn't touch him. David HaMelech was learning Torah, couldn't touch him. In the time of Mem, Mashiach, the people that are going to be learning Torah are the only untouchables for this Yetzer Hara. And those are the people that are going to go on to greet Mashiach. So understand, when you come in here at night to learn, 
understand when you wake up in the morning and you go to learn, you're buying a ticket out of here, out of this galut. That's what the Gemara over there in Chelek in Sanhedrin writes. Who's going to survive ikvitad mishicha? Who's going to survive the birth pangs of the difficulties of Mashiach? Who knows what's coming? The Chafetz Chaim told us that Gogu Magog, the war that's going to bring Mashiach in, has three parts. Part number one, four or five years, but then there's going to be a short break. Part number two, four or five years, but then there's going to be a long break. Part number three is going to be only three hours. He said this in the 30s. At that time, probably people heard that, they laughed. What type of war lasts three hours? <laughs> today, it's no laughing matter. Today, we know what he's talking about. We, we understand how a war today could last for three hours. Do you understand what type of zechut we need? We need the zechut HaTorah. Because that's the only thing that makes you immortal. That's the only thing that makes you bubble wrapped. That's the only thing that makes you untouchable. There it is. You have the entire history of this world in the first name of the first man, Adam. Aleph, he came after Adam, couldn't touch him, he was learning. Dalit, he came after David, couldn't touch him, he was learning. Mashiach, he won't be able to touch you. Now, in the times of Mashiach, as long as you're holding on to the Torah, Learn, my friends, besides the fact that it's delicious. But learn, learn, learn. Hold on to it, learn. Keep coming in. This is our ticket out. This is our way out. So if that's the case, now we understand why he went after Chava. He didn't go after Adam because he was untouchable. But Chava wasn't learning. Chava went out to work. Gentlemen, the minute you close that book and you walk out these doors, he's waiting. La petach chatat rovets. He waits by the doorway and he says, <laughs> just get off base. Remember when we used to play freeze tag? Used to wait for that kid just to, just to, you know, used to hide that he shouldn't even think you're around. It's exactly what the Yitzhak does. The Torah's base. As long as you're on base, he can't touch you. So what does he do? He hides as if he's not around at all, like he's not even on the planet. And this guy's sitting and learning like, like he's steiging like nobody's business. And he says, wow, I killed him. I beat him. He's done. That's it. KO. Little does he know, he's hiding at the corner. The minute you walk out that door, the minute you walk out the door and you let go of the learning for one moment, and we have to go out to work. We have to support a family. We have to go out to work. We have to be responsible. And you guys are working hard. I know you. And you work well. You're talented. I know you guys. But understand that the minute you get off base, he can tag you. You need to know that. La peta hatat rovets. He crouches by the door and waits you to step off of base, waits you to go outside, waits you to come to the city. He waits for you on the trains. He waits for you in the billboards, on the sides of the buses, on the sides of the bus stops, in all types of shapes, figures, and sizes, screaming your name. Look at me. I'm talking to you, kid. Look at me. That's why he went after her. Because she went out. And as she went out to work, that was the moment that he can grab her. And what does he do? He comes up to her. And look at this. Like a real used car salesman. Look at, look at the way this guy talks her down. This is amazing. Watch this. You know, at first, if you take a look at the psukim, he's feeling her out. Just to see where she stands on the topic. <clears throat> I know this is scary to think how how, how, how funny and similar this sounds. He talks her to see where she's standing on the topic. Sounds familiar. To see where she's holding. How much of a give she has. Listen to these psukim. Unbelievable. You hear this? It's unbelievable. 
We're allowed to eat from the regular trees. However, God said, Don't eat from it. Don't even touch it. You know why? Pen timutun. Because maybe you'll die. And Nachash says, what did you just say? You just quoted God and you said, pen? Maybe you'll die? <laughs> you're mine. Now you're mine. Maybe you'll die? You just quoted God and you said, Maybe? If you're not sure if you're going to die, I'm sure you're mine. If you're not sure that you're going to die by doing what God said you shouldn't do, I'm going to make sure that you think you'll never die. And boy, wait till you see what I'm going to do to you now. And boy, wait till you see how many directions I'm going to spin your head I'm going to turn you upside down. I'm going to turn your world upside down. And that's the moment that he strikes. He was talking to her and talking to her, kacha, very, until he was looking for that little crack in the window. And the moment he found that crack in the window, like a real king cobra, he, he attacked. Says Rashi, what did he do? He grabbed her, Rashi. What did he do? He grabbed her and he pushed her into the tree and said, see, you touched it. Nothing happened. So by touching it, nothing happened. By eating it, nothing will happen either. Watch London now, how he's going to twist her brain backwards. Nothing happened to you. What's the problem? You had other boyfriends. Did anything happen to you? Oh, oh, oh. He woke for that moment, and the minute he saw the weakness, he used it. Pen Timutun. Says the Be'er Yosef, the giveaway on how the Nachash knew that he's going to get her was the word Pen. Because if you don't believe 100%, then I'm going to take you for a ride. And guys, from here says the Bar Yosef, such a yisod in emuna and bitachon. Yitzhak Hara does not come up to a guy and tell him to break Shabbat. He knows that that's not negotiable. I keep Shabbat. I'm not breaking Shabbat. Yitzhak Hara knows that this guy keeps kosher. So when this guy drives by Burger King, there's no challenge for him. He doesn't even think twice that I'm going to walk into McDonald's to order up a fries, a burger, or whatever it might be, a cheeseburger, or whatever it might be. Because, what do you mean? It's not, even, it's not even a suffix to me. There's nothing to talk about. I'm not breaking Shabbat. I'm not breaking Kashrut. I'm not going to break Kippur. Yom Kippur? Is there anybody here ever thought for a second to eat on Yom Kippur? Did you... Did you have this feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go into a side room and wait for nobody to look. And then I'm going to pull out my bag of dipsy doodles. And I'm not talking when you were nine. I'm talking about now, when you're 19. Did you ever even think this way? You might have thought, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. Okay, fine, we're all hungry. But did you ever think for a minute, I'm going to go break Yom Kippur? Never. And he didn't even try to get you to challenge you on that. You know why? Because he knew that you stood solid. You believe in Yom Kippur. He ain't going to touch that. You believe in Shabbat. He's not going to touch that because you're solid. Your belief is solid. There's no questions. But to play ball on Shabbat? Ah, is there really something that bad? Ah. You said pen? Did I, did I hear? Somebody have a pen? Did I hear you say pen? <laughs> now you're mine. And from that, he's going to break you. But what do you mean? What's so bad about playing bull on Shabbat? No, no, my love, but watch what happens. 
the ball on Shabbat always, somehow or other, gets over the fence onto the street. And here's the smart aleck guy that starts instead of, no, I didn't pick it up. I kicked it. I kicked it. I kicked it. I kicked it to him. I kicked it to him. We're playing basketball. It turns into a soccer game. I kicked it to him. I kicked it to him. And then the next time, he says, ah, what's the big deal? He just picks up the ball and carries it back into the yard. And then after that, watch what he does from here. He goes from the ball playing, which was, eh, although the ball was mukse. But then he gets the guy after that to carry in a place that he's not allowed to carry. And then once the guy says to himself, oh my gosh, I'm carrying on Shabbat, so what's the big deal? So I might as well just carry. So the guy starts carrying on Shabbat without anybody knowing because I do it anyways. It's one of those things that I just didn't get to yet, Rabbi. What do you mean? You used to never carry on Shabbat. Yeah, you know, I had my ups and downs. So now the guy starts carrying on Shabbat all the time. And then, and then after he carries on Shabbat, which at first is only the key to his house, then he starts carrying his phone. And then he gets him to turn his phone on on Shabbat. Just to check my messages. I'm not going to call anybody. I mean, I don't want anyone to know I'm doing this anyways, so I can't call anybody. But check in my messages. <coughs> and really, what's the big deal anyways? You know, the TV's on. The Chadam, it turns the channels. Okay, so the TV's on on my phone. What's the difference between the TV in the living room or the TV on my belt? Is there any difference? In truth, there is no difference. They're both terrible. And they both destroy Shabbat. And the truth is they both destroy a lot more than just Shabbat. But that's not tonight's quiz. And little by little, watch where he's going to go with this. And that's what he did to Chava. He heard the break in the window. He saw her weakness. She wasn't 100% believing the word of God. She said, pen, maybe. He said, maybe, your mind pushes her into the tree gets her to crack a little more, and then gets her to crack totally by getting her to eat, and this is the way of the snake. And every good salesman knows what I'm talking about. Because he was the first of all salesmen, the Nachash. He was. And boy, does he know his sale. Does he know his melacha. And Rabotai, <coughs> that's why he went after her, and that's how he got her. Says the Ber Yosef, Hashem is not a maybe. It's not maybe he exists. I'll play my odds. It's not, you know what, I'm not sure. So sometimes I'll do mitzvot. And in case I leave this world, I still have an insurance plan when I die to come up with something. That's a very warped way of thinking. Hashem is not a maybe. And the belief in Hashem is not an also. Hashem says, I want to know where you stand. Do you believe in me? Do you believe only in me? Says the Chobat HaLevavot something incredible. He writes, you know, you think that the Baal Bitachon is somebody that walks around looking very different than everybody else. He's not. He's not. Exactly what everybody else is doing. The Baal Bitachon is doing the exact same thing. The only difference between the guy that has Bitachon and the guy that doesn't have Bitachon is his mind. That's why the book is called Chobat HaLevavot. The duties of the mind. People think it's the heart, but it's not the heart. It's the mind. It's the attitude of what your head is thinking. When you call the lawyer, you really put your trust in him? Or did you believe that maybe this guy is going to be a Shaliyah from God? But it's only Hashem. What did you think? Two guys are doing the same thing. They're both picking up the phone. They're both in trouble. They're both calling their lawyers. One is thinking, this guy's going to save me. I pay him top dollar. And the other guy is thinking, please Hashem, help me. You're the only one that could save me. I'm going through the regular, normal route of taking care of problems to show you that I'm responsible. But I know that it's not this lawyer, and it's not that hookup, and it's not this protexia. It's only you. On the outside, you won't see a difference between these two guys. They're doing the same thing. But what is the difference between the guy with bitachon and without? The mind. 
the pen, are you still hanging on God as maybe as a backup plan or an also? You know how many people we speak to today and you ask him, you believe in God? Of course I believe in God. You go to anybody, of course I believe in God. And then when it comes down to it, oh my God, I got to get a great lawyer. Oh my gosh, I got to find a great doctor. Oh my gosh, I got to do this. Oh my gosh, I got, that guy's going to get me through. This guy's going to get me the bear. That guy's going to get me the sale. I got to wait on the right day of the week so that they put up the right buyer, the guy that my friend's friend's uncle knows, and that's the way I'm going to get the sale. Otherwise, I'll never get the sale. Really? He's giving you the sale? He's curing you? He's petitioning for you? Says Hashem, then what am I? What am I to you? You're an old soul. Says Hashem, I'm not an old soul. Just like your wife would not be allowing you to marry another woman. She wouldn't allow you to have a marriage built on an also. She wants to be a had to you. Hashem echad, ushmo echad. Says Hashem, I'm your only one. And if you say pen, you'll know what's gonna happen. These are the areas that Yetzirah brings us down in the areas that he sees we're not 100% believing. Hashem wants 100% reliance on him and no one else. And I promise you, if you could do that, you will see miracles, miracles, miracles. Listen to me, guys. Open your hearts. I know the hour is late. I know. Mechilaf. But let me just end off on a point that might change your life. This point might save your life one day. My father went in for a routine operation. It was so routine and it was so small that they didn't even put him out. They didn't even put him under anesthesia. It was an operation that he had, a, he had some sort of a blood clot in his leg. All they had to do was give him a local anesthetic on the bottom of his leg. And then they would, I, I know this looks difficult, but they would then put a stent through the bottom of the foot to clear the clog, the clot that was in his leg, just to clear it through. It was like a liquid Drano type of an operation, just to clear the pipe, to clear the vein. And he was up, and the doctor was there, and he was doing it, they were talking to each other, they were laughing at the same time, joking around to each other. All of a sudden, something went wrong. And while the doctor was pushing the stent up, instead of pushing it through the vein, he hit an artery. And my father started bleeding almost to death. At that moment, the doctor leaps up, grabs something off the shelf, puts it under my father's tongue inside his mouth and tells him, if you don't want to die, you will swallow this now. My father didn't know what hit him. The whole world went like literally went dark for a moment. It's like time stopped. And he was in this bad type of a twilight zone. And the same doctor that he was laughing with a second or two ago is sticking something into his mouth telling him, if you don't swallow this now, you're going to die. So quickly, out of sheer trauma and panic, he listened. And it put him out in a moment. And they did an emergency surgery. And they ended up stopping Baruch Hashem. The bleeding. And then the doctor, what was seemingly to be just a simple procedure, redid the procedure and finally took out the clot. My father woke up and he couldn't see. He lost his vision. He could not see. At first they thought that it was uh, some sort of an altercation, maybe from the trauma or the fear that he went through on this operation. But then later on, a few days later, when my father ended up going to the real specialists, they told him, no, you had a stroke. That operation and that big mess up that the doctor did threw you into a manual stroke. And he suffered a stroke and lost his eyesight, he lost his vision. He couldn't see more than literally someone who 
whose face was right in front of him. But if you stood an inch to the right or an inch to the left, he couldn't see you. No peripheral vision and hardly any distance vision. It was literally just someone that stood right in the front of his face. He saw them barely. He didn't know what to do. And my father was so depressed. Will he ever see again? Will he see his kids? I mean, will he see his family? We all ran. We dropped everything we were doing when we heard what happened. We went to visit him. And we saw that when we walked into the room, he didn't even turn his head. He didn't even know we were there. He didn't know we were there. We were broken. He was broken. And we started to dominate our hearts out. He comes back home to Lakewood. And the doctors told him, don't worry. Maybe. Miraculously, your sight might come back. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And then it comes the first day of yeshiva. And my father's sitting there depressed at home. And he tells my mother, I can't go to yeshiva. I can't read. I can't see. My chavutah, I'm going to have to tell him that he's going to have to learn with somebody else this month. And my mother told him, no, don't worry. You'll see. One day you'll go back. In the afternoon, Ben Azdarim, I call up my mother to find out how my father's doing. She says to me, you're not going to believe it. Your father went to yeshiva. I said, what? He told me he's not going to yeshiva. But how could he go to yeshiva? He can't see. He can't see. He can't read a word. How is he? What, what, what did he do? How did he learn? She says, here, talk to your father. She puts my father on the phone. I said, Abba, what happened today? I thought you weren't going to yeshiva. You can't read. You could hardly see anything. He says, I know. He says, when I woke up this morning, I was so depressed. And after I prayed, I sat here in the house and I told your mother, I'm not going to yeshiva. I can't see. But then I said, no. Who gave me these eyes? You made him work once. I believe in you. You can make him work again. He got up. He put his coat on and he tells my mother two minutes later, I changed my mind. I'm going to Yeshiva. She said, what? What are you talking about? He says, just take me to Yeshiva. She literally held him like, 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 I don't want to say it, like a blind man. She put him in the car and took him to Yeshiva the first day of this month. He walks into Yeshiva. A few guys run over, put him down on his chair. His chavuta comes by and he tells him, just give me a few minutes. He opens up his Gemara and he tells me that this is what he did. He says, I opened up my Gemara and he says to me, Dubru, I looked down and I saw nothing. Nothing. And he says, I closed my eyes and I said, Abba, I am not moving from here until you let me learn. gave me my eyes. I believe in you. You're going to let me see again. And he says, he looked down. He saw nothing. He says, Abba, I believe in you. You're going to let me see. Let me see. I need to see. I need to learn. I love you, Torah. I love you. You let me see once. Let me see again. He says, he looks down, he sees a blur on the page, a blur. He says, Abba, I'm not leaving here until you give me my sight back. I will sit here for a week. I am not moving from here until you give me my sight back. I need to see. I need to learn. I need your oxygen. I need to breathe. I need my eyes. I need to learn. Please give me the words back. Let me see. He says he looks down again and he starts to see lines. And then after five minutes, he starts to see vague words. And then after a half an hour, he was able to read the page. Half hour. Of an old Jew who didn't say pen. He said, Hashem, I believe in you 100%. 
hundred percent. And I'm relying on you. And nobody else out there can help me but you. And he stood there and sat there until those words came back. And they came back. Because when you leave the pen out and you say, Vadai, it's you. And Vadai, I'm relying on you. And Vadai, you're the only one. Hashem says, you relied on me? For that alone, I'm not going to let you down. Because you relied only on me. Abutai, guys, any situation in life, this is the challenge. We all believe, but do we only believe in him? Take a few minutes a day, talk to him. Five minutes, quiet room, and just say, Abba, I believe only in you. Hu yikra'eni avi atta, your Abba. You're my Abba. You love me more than I know what love means. Am somech alecha, rak alecha, only you. You're the one that brought me this problem and you're the one that I'm relying on absolutely to take it away. Abba, I love you. And I'm relying on you. And at that moment is the moment of miracles. Thank you for listening. Thank you.